Maris, Kareem, good morning, guys. How are you today? Good morning, well, right there. Good, good. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Thank you very much. Not bad at all. Good, good to have you here again. First attempt at this podcast when, when I was abroad didn't really go so well, which is funny because I was in Dubai. You'd expect the internet to be really fast there, but uh, probably where I was. So thank you for joining me again today. Um, appreciate taking the, your time uh, of the day. Um, let's get right into it. Get down straight into it. Responsible gambling from a gambling company. Okay, so this isn't, this isn't, we're not, we're, just to highlight to the audience, Kindred is a gambling company. Um, and we are talking to two people from Kindred, they'll introduce themselves now, about responsible gambling. Yes, quite ironic. But Maris, let's start with you. Do you want to give us a little bit of an introduction as to who you are, how long you've been at Kindred, and what it is that you do there? Sure. So my name is Maris. I'm the head of responsible gambling and research in Kindred. I've been with the company since 2009, so quite a long time, straight out of university. So 12 I, years. Yes, yes. Uh, it's my first full-time job, <laughs> to be fair. Your uh, only full-time job, it sounds. It's basically. Yes. Um, uh, I, uh, I joined Kindred as soon as I finished my degree in psychology, and I was doing my master's in psychology. And I was as a typical master student broke, so absolutely all been. <laughs> we've all, uh, you know, whether it's a master student or not, we've all been there. Student exactly. broke, exactly, absolutely. And uh, and at the time, I joined as a fraud analyst, so it wasn't really my intention to stay for it this long. I just thought it would be a job to support my finances and then go on to psychology in another field or something like that, and then. I, I did the switch as soon as, you know, I I started looking at the data, I started looking at the the things that the potential stuff that the company could be doing in this regard. And I was lucky that I got the support. So I I then moved on to responsible gambling as soon as I got my masters. Okay, and what is it that so you say you moved on to responsible gambling. What is it that you do currently? So currently, there was a major shift from when I started to now, because when I started, it was on my own. So obviously, I was doing kind of like building up RG, building up everything. Nowadays, I'm very lucky because I have a huge team to support me, three amazing RG managers, and I'm more focused on strategy and research. Okay, so you say you've got two, three responsible gambling managers, basically, who yes. report into you. What, what is it that, what's the function of this team? So we have uh, PSDS teams, which is led by our colleague Esther. And I think there are around 15 people reporting to her. And mainly this team takes care of uh, customers that are detected on our system. So we have a system that will analyze customer behavior. And if it spots that there are some markers of harm, they will try to de-risk the situation. So they will try to either promote certain tools like limits or call the customer to ensure that he's okay. Then we have another team who's taking care of more customer queries that come in and how to optimize their journey. Because our G should never be seen as a burden, you know, it should be like we should optimize RG from a customer experience, get RG for everyone. And then we have a relationship manager that helps with collaborations we have with treatment centers, with people with lived experience, researchers. So quite a big task overall. So you guys then put quite a bit of effort um, into the, the, the responsible gambling um, part uh, or side. And obviously, it's it's developed over the years, but isn't it a bit? I don't know. Kind of, uh, you know, it, it it kind of defeats the purpose of a gambling company. I mean, if one is to think to themselves, gambling company would normally benefit from people kind of being addicted. So, what's what's the sense behind it? It's a, it's a huge misconception that gambling companies would benefit from someone with a problem. Um, primarily. You don't want people to develop a problem because at one point the money will run out. So they might actually resort to either criminal activity or stealing 
to fund their gambling. And then there's huge uh, regulatory issues there. There's huge legal issues that, I mean, I've seen fines that companies would have made, for example, like thousands from a customer. And then the fine would be twice or three times that much. So you haven't really made any profit there. Um, You have a lot of brand issues. So, you know, it takes so much to build a brand, but so little to destroy it. And we we aim more for the sustainable gambling. So we have a customer who's detected early, help him set a limit, and he stays longer with you. So if you have a strategy which is more quick win, you just want a lot of money quickly, then yes, I would say RG is a huge oxymoron. But if you want sustainable gambling, if you want people to stay with you for longer, then I would say, yes, you need to help them proactively, prevent them from developing harm. And if you have someone that is showing harmful signs, maybe it's just best to get them to stop gambling. Because in the long term, it will not really be beneficial. Okay, so my understanding is that Kindred, as an organization, kind of pioneered this responsible gambling approach. And I believe this was back around the 2012, uh, which we will talk about that. Obviously, yourself, you it was, it was essentially you who pioneered that. We'll talk about that now. But before I do, before we move into that, would you say responsible gambling now um, as, as a section these days? Do you think it should be a responsibility that all gambling companies really take upon themselves that actually we need to look after our players um, or do you think it's just something that it's nice to do but not necessarily you know a must shouldn't necessarily be a must it's, it's a must have from so many different domains it's a must have because I mean essentially you don't want your consumer to experience harm and we need to keep into account that with gambling disorder you have a ripple effect it's not just the gambler who will be impacted so it's a social issue as well so for every gambler research is showing that at least 22 people are impacted so although the prevalence might be quite low the impact is quite large and as well i mean it's it's a must have for the company if you want to build a good brand if you want to build a brand which is not just associated with harmful revenue, then you need to have responsible gambling. I think the, the only difference is that before responsible gambling, and some companies still see it this way, is something reactive you do when it's too late. And of course, then it will be seen negative. But if you're proactive about it, it will have really positive results, even on a company perspective. Okay, then talk us back. Talk mm-hmm. us back. Let's let's begin. Uh, as I said earlier, Kindred pioneered this in 2012. It was really Maris who pioneered this in t- 2012. What prompted you to do it? What? Why come up with something like this in the first place? Um, I was I was a fraud analyst at the time, and I could see that you know there was so com- so much commitment from a tech perspective, from a developmental perspective to look into fraud detection. Because obviously, if someone committed fraud, then it was a cost on the company. But seeing that I was still doing a lot of voluntary work in the psychology field, constantly being exposed to type of behavioral addictions, I realized that the data is there. So it's not like when you go, for example, shopping, you you can't really see exactly which item on your app, for example. But in this case, we could. We could see at which point the customer logged in. We could see how the customer is depositing. So um, I, I pitched the idea to the head of legal and compliance at the time, Ewood, and I told him I want to try and see, can I be proactive about this? Can I see some patterns, some markers of harm? Can we can we test it out? You know, Can we try to actually ask customers, are you okay? And that's how it started. It was just one crazy person met another crazier person and they said, okay, let's try it. But what, why do it? What made you think, okay, yes, the data's there. Great, fair enough. You feel like you could do this, but what prompted you to do it in the first place? I think it was more 
the the harm I had seen from gambling disorder through my psychology background. Uh, I so felt you've that studied it, you researched it basically. Yeah, I, I've seen. I think affected others were always like um, the mo- the biggest soft spot for me, because you have people who did not gamble, people who did not choose to to place a bet, impacted by someone else's decision, mm. and. I just thought, why not try? It wasn't like I thought I will have a career in this. I said, like, since I'm here, why not even try to challenge the status quo? Well, that's incredible. I mean, I'm sure on behalf of many people, I can easily say thank you very much for that. You know, not many people would have probably thought about this. Uh, it's a very noble thing. Um, so it's it's incredible. Talk us then. You got the green light. Yes, go ahead, start to do it. But um, my understanding from speaking to you guys, the reality was much harder than it sounds. I mean, people who are listening now would think, oh, okay, she started (laughs) doing that, the data's there. Do you want to talk us through some of the challenges? And Karim, I know we haven't reached your part yet. Your part will come, we will get you involved here. Um, No, it was hell. There's no better way of explaining Ah, it. That's what people (laughs) want to hear. That's the word, yes, absolutely. I don't know how how I I didn't just quit. Um, you That's you had <laughs> That's what I want to hear. you um, you start researching something in a company that uh, no one was doing it. The industry had no idea about this, so you're constantly trying to do stuff that you know you're just trying to grasp from different places. I I was very lucky because I was um, I was a like approaching people with lived experience who had a gambling addiction. Um, And I was approaching treatment centers. So those were my support systems at the time. But you have to keep in mind that it's a tech company. So how can I use this data? How can I optimize it? And I have no tech background. So my background was always psychology. So I think in the beginning, I was literally just downloading Excel sheets and like building algorithms myself constantly excel crashing which was killing me um because with that much data absolutely exactly yes. with that much data um so you have you're trying to shift the mentality of a company and of different people in the company but at the same time the resources were in the best because i was just making do with what we have so it wasn't that easy, even just to get some data sometimes. I, I would wait three months just to get some data. And then by that time, my mind would have already thought of something else. But I think this is where I was lucky in Kindred because the management recognized this. They recognized the pains. So uh, they gave me more support. They gave me people that can support. And we built an RG team. And then in 2017, Karim joined um our malta office so we had we had actually met before in london where we proposed the same thing to detect markers of harm which was quite interesting to see but i think having someone with tech background tech knowledge and then myself with psychology when we merged it, it we saw so much change you know so much optimization that i had no idea that could be delivered so let's let's we'll, we'll, we'll get to that we'll get to that that's going to be okay. the next step. But let me just rewind a little bit to you gathering that data. So, and you said you obviously you're trying to build your own algorithms. So, do you want to perhaps share with our audience what data were you looking for? What, what algorithms were you trying to build? So, how you know how were you trying to find out who's becoming addicted or not? Because this is a big technical chunk, basically. So what I was trying to do was I tried to merge psychological research to operational reality. So okay. there was um, there was this study published by Professor Hafley and others in the University of Luzerne, where uh, they looked at people who self-execute, so who take a break, and what happens before. And the main results were that these customers were increasing in, a, in amount of contacts with customer service, but becoming impatient and abusive. So uh, initially, I remember that customer service had this program where they had to wrap up every contact. So the data was there. 
but I had to ask some of the agents to report if there's some psychological strain, some abusive communication from the customer. So initially I was downloading these files to see like the different contacts, who's contacting us, um, and trying to to do a sort of um, like algorithm, but looking into like the average number of contacts with standard deviation. So it goes beyond the average. Why do some people increase? And at the time I realized it was still too late because people would have experienced significant level of harm. By that time, it's already happened, yes. basically. So then I started looking into chasing losses, which is like a major indicator of um, of harm, where you have people who who are playing more and more to get back what they lost, which is quite mind baffling because you know you're spending more money, but there's a distortion at that point for the person because you They're... want to win whatever you lost. Exactly, you're willing so... to risk it order to get it all back yes and i remember something which was quite intensive from one of the lift experience who said i i wanted to have any other form of addiction not gambling because gambling gives you hope every time mm. that there's always that little hope that you might win because your focus is on winning back what you lost chasing that feeling So that's when I started looking into the deposit behavior and the withdrawing behavior, so the financial behavior of customers. And uh, I would get a report initially every week, but then it was daily, where I would have every deposit made and then try to sort it out in a way that you have like a user, customer, and all the deposits for that week and calculate if there was a significant increase or not. But obviously this was challenging because if you have someone who's usually gambling five euro and all of a sudden he's depositing 50, it was also a challenge to explain like, why should I care about this customer? You know, mm. it's it's such a small amount, but it was also a matter of affordability. 50 euro for me is different than 50 euro for Karim, for example. Absolutely. So, Especially so for it, someone who's like investing or gambling exactly. little money to suddenly go, of course. Exactly. So it was very much manual. Um, wow. I, I think it was like 12 hour shifts <laughs> at least. <laughs> And most of it was waiting for Excel not to crash, to be fair. <laughs> See, this is this is one of the things when we spoke last time. I felt to me when we spoke, I felt like, yes, obviously you work in that kindred, but the reality is it was as if you have your own startup and you're working on it because it is technically you started this project and you were you know you were given responsibility yes obviously you got the buy in from the management but essentially it was you trying to build this so we've got now an idea as to how much of a hell it was the difficulty you know throughout and then the savior kareem descended <laughs> came to malta in 2017 kareem I would like you to, you know, now give us a bit of an intro, obviously much delayed, but, you know, tell us what you currently do here at Kindred and, um, you know, how did you end up here working with Maris? Well, uh, currently I'm the head of legal and compliance analytics at Kindred. Uh, so we are a data analytics team dedicated to the legal and compliance department. So we work mostly with responsible gambling, but also with fraud and compliance, regulatory things and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I started, uh, I didn't start my career with Kindred. I first worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a few years. And then I was in London back then. And I joined the Kindred analytics department in London, like eight years ago. Uh, I worked with different departments, like um, customer experience, uh, products, uh, stuff like that. I touched in different uh, environments, but then at some point I wanted to move to Malta. Uh, my wife pushed me as well. She was tired of London. Uh, so we asked for him. I completely understand why. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, I, I, I do have to admit that she was right. It was the right decision. Uh, but... Um, Yeah, so then uh, um, I requested if I could move to Malta. I was already in touch with uh, Maris and um, some fraud teams there, so I already knew a bit of people there. 
So yeah, I moved internally from London to Malta and started working with uh, Maris and all. Yeah, okay, which was quite challenging. So let's 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 talk about that then. So we got a bit of an idea um, from Maris as to how challenging this whole thing has been uh, prior to you obviously joining in. You came in in 2017. Everything was basically manual Excel sheets. Maris is pulling to all of our shifts. Uh, what was your job? What was it? What what did you? What was the task like for you when you came in? Wow, 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 it's been a long journey. I remember like you, when you say Excel spreadsheets, Marys had so many Excel spreadsheets. And so she wasn't <laughs> no. the only one, but she had so many. And, uh, I, lo- I, I, I love that. Marys was like, we have Excel sheets. And you're like, she had so many Excel sheets. Yeah. Not one, not two, so many. <laughs> Each Excel sheet means several Excel sheets, you know, per oh, year wow. or per month or per week or something. And it's all stored in a folder. And See, Maris, it's all coming out now. It's all coming out now. <laughs> and they all had different formats. So even if you wanted to merge them together to do one data set, like the, the columns are like this and they have different columns and all that. And it was a nightmare. It was, it was a proper nightmare. <laughs> uh, to be fair, when I moved to Malta, to be completely honest, I thought it would be easy. Because it's just one department. I used to work with different departments in uh, London. So quite challenging, like the gaming department, you had poker and all that, like it was quite diverse and all that. And I thought, yeah, in Malta, it's going to be cool, you know. And then I came up with all those sheets. And yeah, it was a nightmare because we work with our studio mainly. And um, then suddenly you end up trying to clean up pixels. Uh, Also like the um, domain expertise, you need to build it up. Because there's one thing is that many data jobs, data analytics jobs, they, they are around marketing, all right? It's always the same story. It's acquisition, retention, reactivation, and the, the mm-hmm. environment changes, all right? Uh, so even for products like uh, poker players, for example, we acquire them, retain them, reactivate them, blah, blah, blah. You know, like it's always the same story. And then suddenly you end up in a situation where you have fraud or you have uh, responsible gambling where people say, yeah, want to detect people chasing losses, for example. Uh, and it's not always easy to, to translate what's in the human's uh, mind into an algorithm. Because it might, like something like chasing losses, for example, is a very good example. For a human, understanding the concept that you're chasing lo- your losses, so you lost, so you're increasing your risk to make your money back, and uh, maybe you lose again and you keep on doing that. It's very simple to understand that. To explain that to a machine, it's quite complex. Because what do you mean by increase in risk? What do you mean by increase of deposit? Uh, what is the threshold? Because if, if I increase from five to 10, five to 20, you actually did, did times four. Uh, some players, for example, the first deposit they make when they join, it's quite small, and then they increase it on the second one. Maybe there's a lack of trust, or they want to try the product or something. So you need to ignore these, for example. Someone who is from five, 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 10 pounds, and then he jumps to 100, you know, like, it's okay, it was the first deposit. Like, you have a lot of different perspectives, because you have, like, I don't know, like 100,000 different people. And they all do things differently. Uh, one guy could like, for example, his sports book player, he likes to bet on sports and then you have a big event. Yes. He's going to increase his deposit. There was nothing insane with that. And then you see that there was actually a lot of people increasing their deposited amount. Uh, they didn't even, maybe they lost the previous amount, you know, the previous bet, but it was a 10 pounds, something like that. So it, then the complexity comes into place because the thing as well is that one of the biggest change was that initially, whatever you would do for them, they would be so happy. Oh, like, oh, yeah, that's a revolution. Thank you for doing that and blah, blah, blah. Then after one, two years, start being picky. Oh, you see, like those people, they shouldn't be flagged, blah, blah, blah. Because like they get used to the fact that now you have like better system and all that. And then so you have to be more precise and more precise and more precise and more precise. You know? And that's how, this is how basically, so um, you've went from version one, 
of your uh, the PS EDS system onto version two. So version one was basically taking all of Maris's work and making it digital automation. Basically, that's 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 what that's what you had to do. Um, and this is when you told me now your people wanted to be things more precise. Basically, Maris's team wanting things to be more precise. I'm guessing this is what happened in 2019. This is when you started to work on the second version. 